But what Jesus really did is he countered the great philosophers. He countered the foundational people who, the reason, I'm just going to be frank, most people don't understand it, but today's modern Western culture, you're living, by and large, a lot of what Aristotle taught. It's Aristotle, if you really understood what Aristotle taught. Jesus was just, he came in onto the scenes about, was it about 300 years, I believe, after Aristotle, and he was just countering Aristotle. That's why when you even understand what Jesus was using in rhetoric, he was saying, you know your love is made complete when you walk as Jesus walked. And that word walk meant peripatel, which Aristotle's school is called the school of peripatetics. He's saying, no, Aristotle doesn't know how humanity works. I do. I'm the creator of it. And he, all he was doing is he's countering saying, hey, what these wise people are teaching you is actually going to lead to a perishing effect and destroy you. It's going to make you carnally minded. And you don't realize how you're going to get deceived and it's going to limit your ability on the earth. And Jesus comes out of this scenes and he's teaching with authority about how he's going to recreate things, a new humanity from this fallen nature to an inside out philosophy where Aristotle and all these other individuals, Socrates, Plato, the five sages, all these Roman wise people were teaching an outside in philosophy. And so as a spiritual philosophy, which is inside out, which the Romans is just outside in. And that's a human philosophy. And so he's saying, know this new human, this new self, about how you are a spiritual being. And it is a whole new thing. It's a new way. It's a, and it's really about this new life is the philosophy of the new heaven and new earth. He's just saying you can begin it now on earth as it is in heaven. So begin to walk it out in the ministry of reconciliation. Begin the process now so when I come back, you're already well established in this. And so as a whole new way, it's not just add these two th th things to your current life and subtract these three things. He's saying, no, this is a whole new way of doing life, of philosophy. And it's really how about when you get your new bodies, a new heaven, new earth, it starts from here and works backwards. Big macro to micro, where everything in a carnal philosophy, why they think they're wise, is all about the micro to the macro. It's just opposites. There are just two polar opposites. That's why he called it the philosophy of this world versus the philosophy of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So one was macro to micro, inside out to outside, and the other one was just micro to macro, and they really got rid of the macro. That was the objective of the Greco-Roman culture because they wanted to get rid of the gods so that man could be seen as gods. That's why we are we are established in the tears of that. That's why we in the West have a really hard time thinking spiritually because we're 2,000 years past it. And you will get persecuted if you start to teach this. Today's teaching, and what I'm dovetailing on from the past two weeks, I get persecuted the most in the church about because it is spiritual. And so you get hit by both sides. You get hit by the really religious side of legalism, of just natural works, the traditional stoic philosophy, people saying, well, you're trying to teach this new age thing. And I always kind of that saying there's no enough such thing as new age. Ecclesiastes says everything always is, always was, and always will be. The only new age is the new age after Jesus comes. That's the new age. So we are living in an age that's just repeating itself. So that side will persecute me. But then because it's spiritual, you're going to get hit by the charismatic side as well, Pentecostals, because you got one side that's bound up and doesn't do it at all. And then you got the other side who's out of control and not doing it in the right order. And they're going to hit you because they think you're trying to counter what they're doing. And it's all because of you're trying to get people away from works, their works, and back into grace, the works of Jesus and the order that he set before it. So you just have to know that's just how it works. And so, but what we have to do is just accept the fact that we are where we're at. This is the reality we live in. It's the unfortunate truth that uh, this should have been established 2,000 years ago. But the good news is we're living in an age where we do have the written word. And God, through his Holy Spirit, is there is a great awakening happening right now in our church and all across the world. Um, it's just a fulfillment of the scriptures. It says, where the love of, because of the increase of knowledge, the love of most will grow cold. And that's what's happened. So knowledge has gone rampant since, especially since the World Wide Web. 
And so hearts are getting calloused and hardened and, and pride quenches the spirit because they're focused on the micro more and more and they forget the macro. And so the love of most, which is a spirit of love and grace is just getting quenched. But the good news that can be released in your life through understanding and that knowledge. And so that's happening. Today. The great awakening is happening right now. And it can be for us as well. You can release the Holy Spirit back into your life in the fullness. That's the good news. And you just have to know that it's through knowledge and the love of most, and also because the church fell asleep. The Bible defines asleep the fact that people aren't taking seriously the second coming of Christ. They're they are, um, as we'll see in the scriptures, they're taking contempt for prophecy, meaning prophecy no longer has a big deal in the church. Well, the greatest prophecy is Jesus' return and everything that leads up to it. And most people aren't thinking about that. So that's why it's falling asleep. But you and I can wake up, we can remain awake and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, which I hope to release even more in this next season. But to make sure we do it in a godly way is what we began to impart in this next slide. Aaron, if you can hop to the next one. So this, there is a lot of instruction, which I touched on some. Please, if you can go to the next slide, refer back to the Sunday service 2, 8, 12, 18, 22. Um, if, you're, if we are listening online, if you're listening online, if you weren't here, uh, please just refer back online to 1218 because I did a very comprehensive overview of the gifts of the Spirit, addressed a lot of the issues in the church, a lot of the conflict, a lot of the misteachings, and I don't want to reteach that. So if you're new to this, just go back to that. I want to focus on more of the good things than the correction, even though I'll hit on some of it. But since this is new to a lot of us, I'm going to hit on some of the new things again just so that it becomes more established before we release it in this next year. So 1 Corinthians 14 starts out, follow the way of love. When you understand that love is maturity, because God is love, image and likeness, that's what it's supposed to be all about. People want to try to make a work maturity, whether it's speaking in tongues or prophecy or giving to the poor, that's not maturity, that's a work if you think a work is maturity, you're going to fall into self-righteousness, works righteousness, and legalism. A work is love. It's a person. It's an image. Our goal should be to do all these works through his spirit, which is through love and grace. That is what I'm trying to establish before we go into any works so that we don't get deceived on either way of over here on this side of religious legalism while I'm giving my body to the poor and sacrifice and and all this, and look at my works, and I'm more mature, or I'm speaking in tongues, and I'm prophesying because of my works, I'm more mature. No, that's immature on both sides. And if we look at our works, not his, then we enter into immaturity. Maturity is about Christ. That's how you stay centered and grounded and established in love. The work has to be done through him, through love, or it's nothing. It's nothing in the eyes of God. And that's why, as I spoke in 1218, in the book of Corinthians, Paul says, hey, your, your gatherings are doing more harm than good. They're doing the right works, but in the wrong spirit, a self-centered, self-righteous spirit. There are still infants in that and childish. So he addresses that. But we are going to be a mature church. We are going to operate in love and just go through the order which he set for us. We're going to try to follow the way, which is Jesus Christ. If you want to know how to test scripture, you have to align the written word with the living word, Jesus Christ. If you can't see what someone's teaching you through the life of Jesus Christ, what he said and what he did, reject it. Because he's the way, the truth, and life. But if you can see it, then I wholeheartedly encourage you to accept it and run into it. And so that's where running is eagerly desired. It's running in your heart, something you're desiring eagerly. The more you want it, the more you'll get it. The less you want it, the less you're going to get it. It's how it works in anything in life. Even in the natural realm, if you really want something, you go after it and you get it. If you don't really want it, you don't go after it and get it. It's the same way in the spiritual realm as it is in the natural realm. It's just, do you really want it? And Paul exhorts us to eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Now remember, you don't just get one here or there. You start out getting them all because you got the same spirit. We have them all. It's just how you eagerly desire is you've got to get trained and equipped. It's got to get cultivated. You've got to become mature in it. You have to renew your mind to what you've been given. Sit at the feet of someone who's stronger than you. That's humility. 
and they equip you, and then you can grow into it, learn it, and then impart it unto others. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. That's how you eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And it says, especially prophecy for anyone. And so the goal is I want to aim, especially for prophecy here in this church. When we meet as a church, and you'll see why again in the scriptures, because it's so important for building us up in love, because we want to go after the way of love. Love always builds. Now, verse 2, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. I want to make sure people understand this. If you speak in a tongue, it says you do not speak to people but to God. So praying in tongues is your language between you and God. Don't be afraid of eagerly seeking it. It's no different than if I eagerly wanted to learn Spanish or Norwegian or German. Why should I be ashamed or fearful or weirded out by trying to learn another natural language? Let's humble yourself and learn a spiritual language. Just like you would have to learn Spanish and start out with, uh, or Hebrew, I can speak a little bit of alphabet. That's Hebrew alphabet. Now that may sound weird to you, but that's new to you. But that's the Hebrew alphabet. Why should that be any weirder than if I started to pray in my prayer language? Let's just de-weird it. It's not supposed to be weird. It's supposed to become our new identity of who we are as a new creation. And that's why I'm being very patient with this process. The Lord just said, be patient. Don't rush this. Do this maturely so it doesn't become a fad. It becomes a lifestyle. Because that's what we're supposed to be as a new creation in Christ. For anyone who speaks in tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. So you just have to understand, when you're praying in your prayer language, no one else will understand that, per se. But let's go on from there. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Capital S is Holy Spirit. So it's a mystery. But it does go on to say, to clarify it, but the one who prophesies speaks to the church for their, let's all say it, strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So prophecy speaks to the church, which is a group of believers together, for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And in verse 29, we're going to come back to this, but I want to speak to it right away, is it says in 29 to weigh prophecy carefully. Well, how do you weigh it carefully? Keep it in this context of this verse. If someone prophesies, is it strengthening me? Is it encouraging me? Is it comforting me? If it's not, then it's a false prophecy. That is the new covenant way to prophesy. That's why Jesus would rebuke, like Peter, James, and John, when they tried to do it in the old covenant way of Elijah. He's like, no, you're in the wrong spirit. This is the new spirit of grace in the new covenant. When you prophesy, he gives us the platform and the teaching as how to do it. And I'm going to explain more about it. It should be strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Now, you see, you can have false prophecy from the standpoint of too much grace where it's all about comfort. But to get the comfort, you have to have some strength and some courage. See, it comes in the fullness of grace and truth. That's how your measure is. Jesus came in the fullness of grace and truth. They have to be equally taught and understood at the same time. The grace part is God will help us overcome everything through him and his power of his Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. The truth, the natural reality is they're still reaping and sowing. There's good and evil, and the days are going to get darker and harder. That's why we need strength and encouragement to find peace and comfort. But the good news is I can be built up in that prophecy because I understand as the days get darker and the labor pains increase, the light within me and the light within us will get stronger and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be manifest even stronger and stronger and so we can be built up in love. That's how it's a balanced prophecy. But there's a lot of false prophecies happening in today where they're doing it under the old covenant way of works and they're just... They're, they're doing it legalistically for him because you're a word God sending his judgment. No, that is a false prophet. That is someone who doesn't understand the new way of the new covenant that Jesus is doing it in the new order based on Hebrews. And so it should be for strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Verse 29, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies who? So you build who? Yourself. So you have to know, that's why it's good, it's step one into your new identity as new creation, as a spirit being, because it will build yourself up. There's a lot of people who need to be built up, that are discouraged, lack comfort, and feel weak in the midst of this season. There is a mental health crisis going on. 
And so the way to combat that, God gave us the way through the gifts of the Spirit. And one of the best ways is through praying in the tongues because it helps to control the mind and the heart. It's through the Holy Spirit. It's your submitting and surrendering to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, that's the gift of self-control. You come into submission of the Holy Spirit, and it centers you in Christ. And so that edifies yourself. But that's why he had to clean up the camp is it is it's still self-centered. It's self-centered, childish, or mature. Childish. Mature is self-sacrificial. So when you come as a body, you have to understand that this is a primary gift for me. So I'm not going to be self-centered when I come together as a body and distract others as they're growing in. And so Paul just put an order to it so it can build everyone up. So that's why he goes on. Anyone who speaks in tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So prophecy edifies the gathering of the people. So I would like how many of us to speak in tongues? Everyone. Everyone to speak in tongues. It is a great gift. It is an amazing gift. Because it builds you up. It will help you overcome the challenges and trials of this age and the times to come. It is a personal gift that God has given you to center your heart and mind and get out of your head specifically and get into his mind, the mind of Christ in your heart. And if you don't do that, all you're going to do, the natural reality is you got to get out of your head some way. And it's most people choose a vice of, duh, so it's TV. Duh, my phone. Somehow you're trying to slow the mechanism. Some will choose running. Some will choose uh, recreational drugs. Some will use medication. Some will use some external thing to slow the mechanism down naturally. But the thing is, if you use a natural thing, it's not eternal. It's temporary. So it will only do it for a short period of time. And that's why you're constantly chasing after that. And eventually you become dependent on those things. But the way out of it is through his grace and the gifts he's given us to overcome. And tongues is a great way to do that. So he wants every one of you. That's why he's trying to edify every one of us to speak in tongues. But I'd rather have you, he'd rather have us prophesy. Why? Because that builds up the church. He's thinking big picture, the oneness of the group. Because it should build in courage and comfort. Okay? Are we getting it? Pretty self-explanatory when you just slow it down. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets. So the key there is unless someone interprets. So that the church may be edified. Now, brothers and sisters, that's us. So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words in your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. 10. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager, I'm hoping you're eager for this, I'm hoping I'm exhorting and encouraging you to consider this gift and these gifts, to eagerly seek them, since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try you have to try it. You have to get out of your pride, whether it's arrogance or insecurity, they're both pride. You have to get out of your head, out of yourself, and try something new if you've never done it. That's why even in the Pentecost, if you study it and ask, God didn't force it out of their mouth. It says he enabled it. Enabling means it was in them, but they still had to try it. So you can do it. It's in you if you've received the Holy Spirit. You have to get the tongues. You just have to humble yourself and try it. And it's a humbling experience, and it may feel humiliating to you. So that's why I try it, and we're going to make it really practical and give opportunities. Try it. If you're here today and you want to learn it, I can stay later. A lot of times people ask the question, can you just try it for me? I've never heard it. That's how it started with me. I went up to a guy, so I was proficient in it. Thank you, Tim Barnes, if you're listening online. He taught me in such an honoring way how to do this because he taught, was taught the wrong way and abused by it. And he learned through the scriptures the right way and began to teach me the right way to do it. And he modeled it for me. And he just said, hey, it's like any language. You start out with the basics, the alphabet of it, but then you get more fluid. In it. You get stronger in it. And in fact, you can learn multiple languages in your prayer language. And you can eventually learn to sing it. 
and it's exhilarating to the human heart. And that's what it goes on to say. But you have to try it. If you don't try it, you're not going to release it. That's how you release it. Faith is you releasing it. It's you're saved by grace. Grace is what's been done for you. It's in you. It's in your heart. Faith is you just agreeing with what the word of God says and doing it. Okay, I'll try it. And then you release it. So that's how you release it. So you have to try to excel. So try to excel is just like in the natural. You've got to practice it. You've got to do it. And we're going to provide opportunities. Um, it's coming. We'll probably start announcing it next week to, to just practice this thing and do this thing and become fluid in it. Try to excel in those that build up the church. So the key is focus on what builds up the whole church. For this reason, so for this reason, because you're focused on the bigger picture of the church and not just yourself, for this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So let me say that again. Let's all read this together. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So it gives the order there. If you're praying in a tongue, you should pray, God, Help me to understand this. Because it's a mystery until you have to learn God is speaking in your heart. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this new way. It's learning to be in the spirit realm, in the spirit, in the word. And you have to learn to submit your mind, listen to the Holy Spirit. This one used to be called contemplative prayer. We've become so fit, superficial, the church got away from contemplative prayer contemplate just means i'm in the spirit you're going to see this in the scriptures coming up i'm in the spirit i'm listening to the holy spirit i'm looking at the scriptures i'm testing the scriptures the more you get to know the scriptures the easier it is to hear the voice clearly he's always sending the signal the signal's powerful it's like your it's like a phone the signal there's a tower right there the signal's there I just have to align the phone to get a strong sense of it. It's my heart. You have to align your heart to get the clear voice. How do you align your heart? Surrender, submission. But the greatest submission is the more you know this, that gives clarity to the voice. You surrendered and submitted to the word in Jesus. And now it's like, oh, wow, I can hear more clearly. It's not so scrambled. But the less you know this, that's why a lot of people, I was the same way. I was like, is this the voice of God? Am I hearing it? Am I discerning it? I don't know. I got all these voices. Yes, you have multiple voices in your head. I'll talk more about that in the weeks to come as I talk about this new teaching. Every human being filters through about two or three voices. But I'm not going to go down that bunny trail right now. So you just have to learn to submit it to the voice of God, which is the word, and which is Christ. And so for this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So you have to contemplate a prayer. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Help me to understand this so that you can edify others through that interpretation. That is the gift of interpretation. Again, you have all of them. You have the gift of interpretation or else it wouldn't tell you to pray for it. But you have to renew your mind to that. So yes, I can interpret it because I know it's a gift I've been given. So now I'm gonna renew my mind to it. So you start with yourself. You always start learning to discern through yourself. But then when you come together as a body, you learn how to do it as a body. Yes, I can at times discern other people's voices because I've learned how to listen and hear and ask the Lord, what is that person saying? And learning how to test that. That's First John 4, which I'll get into the practical way that Jesus taught how to do that. More in depth in the weeks to come. But can I do it for everyone? No. And that's why he corrects this as we go farther. It says, for I pray in a tongue. So he explains, pray that they may interpret what they say. For if they pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. So when you pray in a tongue, your spirit is praying. That is inside, inside your heart. The Holy Spirit lies. Praise, but my mind is unfruitful. So this is teaching you about your new spirit, soul, and body, your new creation, your new being, your new physiology. You don't learn this in the natural school system. You don't learn this in college. You won't. This is Jesus as a physician teaching us how it works now 
in the new way, in the new humanity. He says, your mind, he's referring to this, is going to be unfruitful. But it starts here. All it is is the opposite. In the natural philosophy of the wise natural men, they said, you need to be logical. Here's how it works. This is what the flesh is defined as. The flesh is you're taking your five senses and things externally, and you're using your mind to rationalize and then decide in your heart what you want to do from that. That's a natural philosophy. The spiritual philosophy from the new heaven, new earth is the opposite. You start from the inside and work out versus the outside work in. It's contemplative. So the word of God is in you. And so you contemplate on the absolute truth that is in you versus the relative truth, which you see out here. You contemplate on the absolute truth in here. You learn to listen and draw into that. And that defines what happens out here. It's just the exact opposite. Jesus just taught a counter philosophy to the one that we learned growing up. That's why in Hebrews, he refers to it as the elementary philosophy. So that is how it works in the kingdom. So your spirit prays, but your mind is unfruitful. And so what they're doing is your spirit is praying on the inside. That is where your mind of Christ lies. It says the Holy Spirit is in your heart, the mind of Christ. That's why it says we've all been given the mind of Christ. And so from there, you then have to then get your head in line with what's in your heart. And it's no different than what you're doing. You're rationalizing from the inside out. It's no different than you're, you're observing out here and you're trying to get your head to rationalize what's happening out here. You see what's happening? You're just taking time to focus from inside out versus outside in and get your head in line with what's inside you versus your head in line with what's outside. They're just opposites, right? So that is the process of the way Jesus began to teach. And I'm going to unpack more of the practical realities of that, hopefully in a very simple way. I've been working on for over a year now, 10 foundational teachings through the life of Christ that hopefully begins to make this very simple and practical so people can start to put it in practice. So for in my, so let's go to 14. For if I, now see how it says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray in my spirit, but I will also, everybody say also, pray with my understanding. So maturity is, okay, I'm going to pray in my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. So that is where you start with your heart, and then you go to your head. It's the opposite, and that's why so many people struggle with prayer in this church, is because we start with our head and then try to get our heart in line. Know your heart is more powerful than your head. Start with your heart and then go with your head. Okay? And again, it will become more clear the more you eagerly seek the truth through what Jesus said, the red letters of the Bible, the voice of God will become more and more clear in your heart because you know how to discern it based on the life of Jesus, because he is the way. So it goes on to say, so I will also pray with my understanding. That's why when we come with a body, those who are eager and zealous, often it's a new thing. This is exciting. It's a tongue. I'm still a child. It's fun. It's good. It can be a really good thing. We need to all start that way. But when we come together collectively, we've got to use maturity and pray with our understanding so that it edifies the body. That's what prophecy is. It's got to be something you understand and you can learn. That's what it goes on to say. Even how, look, you can build. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. So there's two different ways to sing. And that is where it gets really joyful. When you learn to pray and sing inside you. That's where your spirit is. It's in your spirit. Most of you don't even know, like right now, I'm praying in my prayer language. Can you even tell the difference? But I'm doing it. I'm praying all throughout the day. You may not see it manifest. I can let it come out of my mouth. And that's why oftentimes when I'm speaking, I'm asking for a word of knowledge. And I thank you for those who text me or shoot me confirmation because when I pause, I'm often just praying in the spirit and also praying with understanding, Lord, is there anything else you want me to say? And oftentimes when I do submit to that and I say this or that, that's where I'll get the text. Someone says, hey, thanks, that was a right on word. <laughs> you were just in my conversation last night, right? It's not me. It's God knowing the heart of the body and we're helping to build and encourage each other. Does that make sense? When we submit to his way. 
So 16, otherwise, when we're praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. So help you understand, it's just saying, if you're just praying in the tongues out loud, it is edifying you, that's good, but it can be confusing to others and it's not edifying them because they don't understand it. They need to learn from it and understand it for it to edify them. That's how it becomes mature. And so that's the right way to do it. So then, technology is just not my friend here. I'm going to need your help. My clicker, it's not clicking. So let me go to the next one. So it goes on to say in the second part of this, <clears throat> go to the next slide for me. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. That's why you know it has a seat. And he's saying, I am so grateful I speak in tongues. Because it is, I believe tongues is probably the best gift on a personal level for you. Why? Because it says it builds you up. It edifies you personally, individually. That's why I do pray that every one of you begins to pray in your prayer, in a prayer language in tongues. Because when you do that, that is the same way as I mentioned it two weeks ago. It is like a husband and a wife. We're supposed to become the bride of Christ. The most intimate, impactful, relational communication happens one-on-one. -on -one. When it's just you and your husband and wife, that's where you grow the most. When you pray in tongues, it's the same way between you and God. So if you want to be edified in your relationship with God, that's how it begins. So it goes on, 19, but in the church, but in the church, so when we come together, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he's just saying, when you come together as a body, focus more on prophecy. But if you do, it, you'll see it says, don't quench it, don't stop it, but there is an order to it, which I'll just let the scripture speak for it as we go on. So he's saying, I'd rather have you speak in the language that the people are at, and so they can understand it, so that everybody's edified, right? Because the point is to build each other up, not weird each other out. So 20, Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. So that's his admonition. In regard to in evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. So he's just saying, okay, yes, it's good as a child. Think like a child to have your personal prayer language, but that's still self-centered. It's you and God growing together. That's the first step in your relationship as a new creation. You're born again. You're growing. You're edifying. It's a new philosophy. It's a new way. We should all do that. Humble yourself. Begin that. But then when you come together as a body, you become a bigger, greater living organism. So stop thinking like children. And now don't just, everybody pray in your prayer language. There's an order to it. You need to do it in a way that edifies it, encourages you, and builds each other up. So 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquires or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? You're crazy. That's what's happening in today's culture. That's why you're, you don't, you see it in extremisms. Either it's not happening at all or it's out of control because people walk into there and everybody's praying in tongues and it's out of order. It's just immature. And people are like, this is crazy. This is weird. This is, and so then they don't do it at all. And so we got to just out with the devil and not go to extremes is there is an order to do it. He does want every one of us to do it, but let's just submit and surrender and go to us. I think that's a good way. Yeah, amen. Okay, so the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquires. So if that's why on Sundays, we need to do it in a proper orderly fashion. So because anybody could come in here, and we don't want to weird them out. It's not supposed to be weird. It's supposed to be a beautiful thing. It's supposed to be a, an awesome thing. It's supposed to be an encouraging thing, an edifying thing. And we need to have, you'll see grace and mercy and teach and equip and help people grow into that. It's supposed to be a patient thing, but it can happen quickly. All right, so it goes on 24. But if an unbeliever and inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they're convicted of sin and brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, so that they'll fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. That's why if you've ever gotten a prophetic word, I've gotten several of them really solid ones, and I've gotten really bad ones that I had to learn to test. But when you know the Word of God, you know how to test it, you, you just say, all right, that one just, yeah, he spoke to me with a lot of fire, but that fire was misdirected because I know the truth, and that prophecy was not for me. 
or wow, this person, this was right on. It built me up and encouraged me. It gave me comfort and it revealed Christ in me. So true prophecy will go on to say, and I'll show you this coming up. So I'm not going to, let me go into 25, 26, true prophecy. I'm going to teach you how to test it. And so that you don't get weirded out by it as it becomes beautiful and powerful in your life. That comes in later, but it should, if true prophecy happens, man, because it's spiritual, you didn't know the person, the person didn't know you, and they spoke right into your circumstance and situation, you're like, God is here, because this was not natural. God is really among us. He's here. So 26, when they, when, when then shall we say, brothers, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. So I want to review that, 26. When you come together, so that's what we're doing now. Each has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everybody say the next thing. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Well, the Bible tells me to do that. I want the church to be built up, so I'm going to try to release this. But I've been speaking and teaching for now months on this so that hopefully we can do this maturely and avoid both extremes and get into the wrong spirit in either direction so that we can be a seed of mature love that can be out in our community and helping equip others to do this also in their church gatherings. But everything should start to take place so that the church can be built up. A hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, tongue, or interpretation. Everything must be done so the church may be built up. If anyone, now see how it says, if anyone? That would mean that it's not happening every time. So it says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it doesn't mean you're speaking in tongues every time you gather. It says, if anyone, as you gather as a church, because this extreme over here feels like we always got to be speaking out loud in a tongue. No, it doesn't say to speak out loud in a tongue every time. It says, if anyone, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it gives the order. Two or at most three should speak one at a time. And what's it say? Someone must interpret. So when we come together on Sundays, if someone feels that they're inspired in a tongue, someone must interpret it. So that's the command given through the scriptures. One at a time, someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should what? Keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. So that while that saying is this, if there's no interpreter, just keep quiet and just remember speaking to God is your tongue. Just keep it a personal thing. It wasn't meant, there's no interpreter. If, there, if it's truly meant to be for the body, there will be interpretation that comes out with it. It gives the order with it. So the speaker should keep quiet in church. So here's again the order. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or most three should speak one at a time. And someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the other should weigh carefully what is said. So if someone speaks a prophetic word, you have to learn how to weigh carefully, whether you're here or at any other church gathering or conference is where to are more gathered. How do you weigh it carefully? Well, is that word strengthening, encouraging, comfort? If it's not, false prophecy. The other way to weigh carefully, Revelation 19.10 says this, and I... This is John fell at his feet. So this is the angel. So an angel comes to him and gives him a prophetic word. Feet to worship him. And he said unto him, see, thou do it not. I am the fellow servant. So he's the angel saying, hey, don't fall at my feet. I'm just a fellow servant. And thy brethren and have the testimony of Jesus. Everybody say testimony of Jesus. Testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is what? Spirit of so what is the spirit of prophecy? So in the new covenant, there should be a testimony of Jesus in the prophetic word. If there is nothing about Jesus, it is a false prophecy. So now you just have to think of threefold salvation. Are they revealing what he did for us? What he is doing for us, the gifts of the spirit Christ in you, 
because it should build and encourage. If I'm prophesying, I'm building you up and who you are, Jesse, in Christ. I have this word for you. You know what, Jesse? The old is gone and the new has come. Christ is in you and by the power of the gifts in you, they can be released through your will and they can come to full fruition. Prophetic word based on the word of God. That's how you learn. Jesus is the plumb line for everything. And if it's a prophecy, it should be talking about his, if it's something about the future, what's the testimony of Jesus in the future? He's coming back. And the good news is we already have that prophecy. It's called the book of Revelation. We can see it. And so now the more you get to know it and understand it, you can discern. That's the gift of discernment because the word of God is the living word. And so there should be the testimony of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy should somehow be revealing Jesus. If Jesus is not talked in that prophetic word, it's a false prophecy. Truth, remember, Jesus is truth. The opposite of false is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. That's why we can feel safe, because Jesus brings clarity to everything. Okay? So wrapping up here. So he goes on to say, that's how you wait carefully, okay? What were they saying about Christ? Was it talking about how the old is gone and the new has come? About how I'm washed away from my sins, I'm forgiven, it's not about my works? Or is it about now the works of Christ in me, the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Or is it about his works to come and how he's going to save us all? That's how I test it. I mean, it should be one of those three things about the testimony of Jesus. And is that building me up, encouraging me, encourage, and comforting me? It should, right? That is grace and truth. Grace is the good part of overcoming. The truth is the reality is going to get more difficult until after his return. See, we got two extremes prophets happening. We got everybody saying, oh, the, just grace. Oh, it's just going to be good. And it's called divination, whereas divination is where you're just speaking some self centered prophecy. Fortune tellers do it of, oh, this is just good for you. And here's how you live your life. If it's just natural and it's just about you and building you up, that's false grace. That's a false prophecy. That's called divination. If it's just natural things, true prophecy is all about the testimony of Jesus. It's about Christ in you and about when he's coming back and all that's going to happen and why you need to operate or why you should excel or try to excel or want to excel in these so that you can overcome the hardship that's coming in this world because I'm not just going to give you just grace, just sugar. I'm going to give you sugar and salt because you need to understand that Jesus is coming back. There is a preservation coming. He is going to destroy evil. It's going to get harder before it gets better, but you don't need a fear because Christ in you. There should be a balance of grace and truth. That's how you test it. If there's just one, or there's the opposite, which is some people feel puffed up by their pride that they're just truth people. High truth. High truth people are really legalistic from works. Usually they're just talking about they're the they're the old covenant, that's what it is. Law is Anita, because of your works, God's placed this curse on you, and that's why the tornado came. That's a false prophecy. That's all legalism. It's all based on works righteousness. There's no grace in it. When you start to condemn somebody based on their works, that's legalism, that's law, there's no grace in it. That's why, see, we can test everything. It's easy, right? There should be grace and truth. The grace is what he's done for us. The truth is what he is doing and will do to us. It's all about him. That's why we don't need to fear. See how it works? He is the plumb line for everything. Okay? So it goes on. And if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, so we're talking about prophecy now, if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. So if I'm speaking, someone has something, we're going to talk more about the order in the next weeks or two. We've been talking as elders. And I really think the way we've been doing it, yeah, it's been patient. We've been having a lot of conversations. I think it's honoring. I think it's loving because we're having a lot of conversations. But we're going to come out with an order so that we can do this, hopefully, in a safe, loving, building and encouraging fashion. So if I'm speaking, someone has a word, there'll be a way which we'll talk to you in the weeks to come that you can go out and you can test that and share that word. But I should stop. Someone should be able to share. But if someone else gets something, that person should stop. And there should be an order to it one at a time. That's all it's saying. One first speaker should stop. Or you can prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed. This is the Greek word. 
Everyone should be instructed. And that word is learn and encouraged. So they should learn something and encouraged if it's a true prophetic word. You should feel encouraged. Encouraged is actually a gift. In Romans, it's a gift of the Spirit. If you saw how much that gift is used in the scriptures, you would want the gift of encouragement. It's, in, it's always saying encourage, 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 encourage. So you should feel encouraged. The Greek word is parakleo. It means admonish, exhort, or again, comfort somebody. And so a true prophetic word should build the person up. A condemning one is a false prophet. Under the new way and the new covenant. Because grace and love always build, but the grace is, is his works, not ours. You get it? That's the new covenant. New covenant is all about his works. Old covenant is all about our works. It's the new way of doing it. Okay? The spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So let me unpack that. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the control of the prophets. I'll speak from my own experience. When I started getting tongues, and I started getting the gift of prophecy, you're young, you know, you're excited, it's new, right? You want to share that just like a kid. It's like show and tell, look at this. I want to show you what I got. And it's exciting because you're trying to, what is, my daughter always does this. Let me show you this new thing. Why? Because she's trying to act more mature and adult, right? Because it's something new. It's some, right? That's what we're doing in the spiritual realm. So let me show you my new tongues and a prophecy. And when you get something new, just like a kid, your heart starts to flutter, right? That's what happens in the spiritual realm too. There gets a little flesh. That's why a lot of people will Here's how you know how to test this. And I used to do it wrong, too. I had to learn to discern it because you'll see through scriptures you can have true peace. Peace is a contentment, self-control. When you're young in it, your heart, because it's new for you, is it gets really like out of control. You're like, oh, I want to share this. Oh, and your heart's like, I can't, I can't control this. I have to do this. No, you can. You're in spirit of this prophets is subject to control the prophets. If it feels like it's out of control and you have to do this, there's flesh involved in it. True mature is, I have peace in this. I can discern when to give it and how to give it. I don't have to do this. Have to is where flesh gets involved. It's the law and legalism in my works. The true maturity is when you have peace and love and you discern it and you don't, it's a very collective giving so that people can receive it. When I was young in it, I was fervent, but immature, and so I have to go do this. I have to go do this <laughs> because I got really excited. But that's okay. That's okay. In fact, I don't want to quench that because you got to grow in it. You got to learn this new way because when the Holy Spirit starts to move in your heart and you feel that your heart moves because of the Holy Spirit, not just natural things, it's enjoyable. And I want you to enjoy it. But I want us all to understand the process so that if some one and it's okay, just like kids. You gotta, we don't want to embitter children, right? In the natural realm, it says you don't want to do that in the spiritual realm either. So, as people begin to try this and experience it because they're excited because it's a new way and I can operate in this, we also don't want to, I don't want to quench it. It's okay, but I want to teach on it so that we all understand we have grace just like we would in natural kids. We can do it with spiritual kids too. It's good to be excited, but we just need to know how to discern it. Okay? So from there, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. If you ever feel like you're out of control and you have to do this, then you have to say, hmm, I think there's some flesh involved with this. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. See, if it's truly mature, there's peace. Peace is not out of control. Peace is in control. Peace is comfortable. As in, now, all the congregations of the Lord's people. Is it just for us or all the congregations? No. All the congregations. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. So I hope you're eager to prophesy. I hope you're eager to speak in tongues. I hope you're eager to do all of them. I'm trying my best to say it's awesome. Go grow in it. And it's very practical. When I learned this, my mentors and disciples, she's like, Andy, it's a matter of how much you want. In fact, my mentor, he said, you know, the last 2% of your heart is the most important when you're all in, you just comes quicker. Like it's just like boom, because you it's the measure you want is what you're gonna get. And so, and here's the here's the truth. That's why Jesus would say things like, here's here's the grace injury. He'd say, I'd rather have you hot or cold versus lukewarm or I'll spit you up. Because when you're in between, you never get, you're always like, is this real? Is it not? I don't know. And so you're not getting the full effects of either. But when you were made to be wholehearted, right? Love the Lord your God with 
and all your heart. We're meant to be wholehearted. So when you're not wholehearted in something, it's confusing. That's why my mentor said, Andy, when you're wholehearted and you eagerly want this, watch what will happen. And it did. I just pursued it like I did football at one point. I was wholehearted for football and I went nuts and lifting weights and nuts and practicing. So then I just went, using my language, nuts into studying the word of God and nuts into trying to find coaches and mentors that could mentor me in each of these gifts. And see, we're meant to become the image and likeness of God, right? He has all the gifts. So what he's going to do is it's very practical. You have one that you're stronger in. You start in that because of either your nature or your nurture, which I'll talk more about later, is you start in that. You lead out in that in the body so that you can train other people in that gift as you're learning the other ones, as you're being equipped and cultivated in these and growing in these so that you can release that person onto the next thing. Now you lead out in this and then you equip some. And so it's a very practical process. So I just went and submitted myself and still am to this day of trying to grow in every one of the gifts. I'd like to show you how intentional it was. I wanted to grow in the gift of administration. That gift is very practical. So that was part of the reason I got called to go work at the post office. You can't get into more micromanagement administration than the United States post office. So, okay, Lord, I need to get better at this micromanagement for the sake of the body. How can I learn systems and this a little bit better? So I went and submitted myself. That was part of the reason I'm going there. Okay? So there's a practical part of it. So it ends by saying, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid, forbid speaking in tongues. So when we come together, I'm not supposed to forbid it. I want to encourage it. But what, as we come to a body, must happen. Someone must interpret. If they don't interpret it, then the person should be quiet, remain quiet, and then speak to themselves and to God as we come together as a body. Okay? Not to forbid it, but there should be interpretation. But everything, again, how much of it should be done? In a fitting and orderly way. So there is order in the kingdom of God. He is a God of peace and order. And all the order, administration, all the people who like that are like, yeah, he's teaching order, he's teaching structure. And all those who don't like order and structure are like, oh, you're just quenching my spirit, right? But then for some people are too high in the order and get legalistic from it. When I come to this other side and say, hey, there's grace to this. Let's not get so controlled with this. We've got to have some grace with this. Then, oh, yeah. okay, i got to be more relaxed. And this person's like, yeah, finally, we get some grace with this, right? We're, we're coming from these different extremes. They're just balancing. We're all trying to learn to walk in the balance like Jesus. Okay? It's not becoming like Andy. It's becoming like Jesus. We're all supposed to conform into the image and likeness of Jesus. All right. So to wrap up with some encouragements, Revelation 1.9 says this. I want to, did I hit everything? Make sure I got everything? Yeah. Fitting in an orderly way, which we're going to talk more about probably next week, a little bit from our standpoint of our body. Revelation 1, 9 through 11 says this, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Again, in Jesus. I want you to see, Jesus is the way to test everything. So in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of two things, the word of God and the what? Everything's supposed to be about the testimony of Jesus. He is the glory. He is everything. That's your safeguard. That's how you test everything, because he's the way, the truth, and the life. That's how you can test everything. The word of God has to match the testimony of Jesus. If you can't see it in his life, then you chuck it out. But, or you open yourself saying, maybe i got to go read the red letters more. Maybe someone's trying to encourage me something, and I'm stuck in an old tradition. So if I begin to look at Jesus, oh, okay, that person was trying to help me understand that that is how Jesus did it. So it's because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Now, this is a new teaching for carnally minded people. It's hard for them to say. There is a spiritual realm, and you got to learn to go in the spirit. And that can become scary to people coming out of religion and legalism like I was once. What? Is this some new age teaching? Oh, we can't quench the Holy Spirit by be fearing a new age teaching. That's part of the lie. It's an old age teaching. It's called contemplative prayer. There is a spiritual realm. You can enter into the Holy Spirit. It is an outer body experience. 
You're getting out of your body. You're getting out of yourself. And you're contemplating on God and having a relationship and a fellowship and a communion and conversation with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. It is in the Spirit. You have to learn to draw into the Spirit, away from you. When you get into the Spirit, you're you're not really you're you're drawn in. And you and if you're new to this, you learn in your own quiet time first. You have to learn to quiet your mind, take captive every thought, submit it to Jesus, and you draw in and you learn to have a relationship. As you grow in it, you can be in the spirit even as you're moving and talking, and you can learn to discern it. It's just like you have to learn to try to excel in it. It's a practice. It was a very common practice in the early church. It's a very foreign, it seems like a new teaching. That's why there's scariness about this. But it shouldn't have to be. It was just how it was taught in early church. So I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And these are the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So these are the warnings. So we had to be in the spirit. What was? What is he saying? I was in con contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is where you learn to be still and know it's God. You draw into him and you meditate on Christ and you meditate on the word. The word is Christ and you begin to communicate back and forth. Now, if it's truly in the right spirit, it will never violate the written word. And it'll never look anything different than Jesus Christ. That's why you know it's in his right spirit, in his spirit, biggest spirit versus your spirit. It's very simple. If it's in something about you, yourself, that's self-centered, so that's not his spirit. If it's something about the natural realm, that's the spirit of this world. So it's going to teach, it's going to be big S, it's going to teach you the big S plan, the, the supernatural, the big picture of how this whole thing works. Okay? So I was in this, so this is what I want to end with encouragement. Ephesians 6, remember, is our armor, put on the armor of God. That's what he's talking about, all this armor, learning how to suit up, test, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, all these good things. And it goes on, it says, and pray in the spirit on what? So it's an admonition, pray in the spirit on all occasions. The, the new way of doing it is you're always trying to remain in the spirit, abiding in him. So you learn, it's a new philosophy, a new teaching that he's, you're learning how to get your mind to be in subject to your heart, not vice versa. Your mind stays in obedience to the truth, the absolute truth of Christ inside your heart to peace. That's why it says always remain in the bond of peace because God is peace. And so it's the new way from an inside out. So on all occasions, so that's why all throughout the day, I'm praying in the spirit. And I encourage you to consider the same. <clears throat> with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me. This was Paul saying, but I ask you, pray for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I can fiercely make known the mystery of the gospel. So should the gospel be made known? Yes, it should. All throughout the gospel letters, it says that the gospel should be revealed through the church. The gospel is everything that I had on there that was new. Man, I get persecuted. Why do you need to do it fiercely? Because you get persecuted a lot for this teaching from both ends, the extremes on both sides. And so you have to develop, we call it thick skin, but that's just the armor of God is saying, I'm not going to let the outside, whatever I see, whatever I hear, anything that's relative, I'm not going to let that control me. I'm going to let the absolute truth that sets me free inside of me control the situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to become a thermostat versus a thermometer. A thermometer, wherever you go, your temperature goes to that culture. A thermostat changes, sets the temperature. That's how you be light amidst darkness. It's the truth of Christ in you and the hope of glory, the power that no matter what outside of me, that can, because if Christ is in me, if God is greater than everything, we can overcome all things. Okay? So I pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Fiercely make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray that I may declare it fiercely as I should. 
So in closing, before my final verse, please shoot me up. So we're going to talk, I'm going to get very practical about this in the upcoming weeks. I'm trying to make a teaching that's very simple, very practical, because we just got to call a spade a spade in our culture. This is the divisive part. Salvation two is, because salvation one is all about grace. It's what he did for us on the cross, nothing that we did. Salvation three is all about what he is going to do. We don't do anything. It's his coming back and how he's going to save the world. Salvation two is we have a part in this. We're saved by grace through faith. Faith is, it's really, I'm going to teach more on it. It's really all him, but you're just learning to apply what he's done for you, renew your mind. Faith is not something you muster up. It's just you coming into agreement with it and abiding it. But it's the most divisive, and it's because of pride. Because pride in our culture is all about knowledge. Knowledge is about power, right? So that's why in Romans 8, 6, it says the mind governed by the flesh is death. And the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Right now we have a mental health crisis. Why is that? Because it's the wrong philosophy. It's deception. It's people, it's, it's, it's Satan is trying to get the world to spiral. It's, I call it paralysis of analysis. Is we prided ourselves in so much knowledge the deception is, it is we're causing a perishing effect. See, that's that's the deception. It's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is the word of God, the logos. This is called the logos. It's supposed to be logical. It's the absolute truth inside of our heart as to how he taught it as a physician, as a professor, as a teacher, as God, the creator. But we've, we've made, pride has made the knowledge of the natural life greater than the knowledge of the spiritual eternity. And so what's happening is the mind governed by the flesh is death. There is going to be, if you're carnally minded, what is carnal mindedness? Carnal mindedness is, in religion, it's all legalism, the law. It's your constantly under shame, guilt, and condemnation because of your works. Because self-centeredness is leads to death. That's the perishing effect. And I'm going to talk about how these principles work because our battles against principles. Or it's all about, I need to figure out how I do this. And it's the pattern of this world, right? There is a pattern in every one of us by age 20, 30, 40. It's just a carnal philosophy by age 70. Is, so I want to retire by 50 to 70. And there's this pattern. And we're all on this, basically this pattern just to do these things. And the church is taught is trickling one or two nice ideas and get rid of two or three bad ideas and just keep on that pattern. No, this is a whole new way of doing it. If we just keep doing the pattern, there will be a perishing effect. Carnal mindedness does lead to death and it's governance. And it's the same thing. Now, let me just, I feel like I'm supposed to do this to help somebody. I don't know why, but I hope I'm hearing right. I'm going to teach this in spirit, soul, body coming up, but I want somebody to hear this because someone just needs to hear it logically and practical. Here's how the class he works. As one, spirit, soul, body. The mind governed by the flesh. It's the battlefield of the mind. That's your soul, mind, will, and emotions in your conscience. As the mind governed by the flesh, the flesh is just your five senses. So you're trying in your mind to decide what is right and true based on what you can logically see, taste, touch, feel, or hear. And so your mind is being controlled by that. It's as simple as this. Two-thirds majority rules. What is that number? Six, six, six. Two-thirds majority rules. Satan is just trying to get two-thirds of your mind controlled by things. Because then it creates a parenting effect that will destroy you or something I can promise you. If it's not you, it will destroy your relationships or something around you. And it creates a parenting effect. Now, the opposite is, if you just renew your mind, it's called, and you begin to operate from the way Jesus taught versus man taught, that's why the tradition of men make the word of God in effect. Any other teaching outside of Jesus, if you go to Jesus' teaching, the Holy Spirit is just trying to get at least two-thirds, because then you're going to have more peace, you're going to have more hope, you're going to have more joy. The more, and remember, eagerly seek it. So if you give two-thirds to God, how much should you expect getting back in return? You reap what you sow. If you give 100%, what do you think you're going to see come back? 
There's a very practical process to that. Okay, so that's why it's governance. In all governments, two thirds majority rules. Spirit, soul, body. They're just trying to, all Satan's trying to do is to get you controlled here so that the opposite, because if Satan wins the soul, soul realm, they'll produce a perishing effect. If God wins it, it's going to read life and peace. Or they're just. Okay. So when you go with the two thirds, means there's spirit, soul. Ultimately, you give them those two thirds, you get the body. Whereas if you're a saved believer, if you give your soul body, Satan can't corrupt your spirit. Because you're under the blood. You're sealed. So you're sealed. So he can only ever get two thirds if you give it to him. But when you give two thirds to Jesus and accept him, you get it all. So it's not six, six, six anymore. You get it all. You get 100%. When you say, I'm in, you get 100%. Which I'm going to talk, thank you, Austin. We're, I'm going to get very practical with that. That's called the authority of the believer. So the thing is, you just have to know, and I'm going to talk a lot about this. You have all the authority. Satan can do nothing unless you give him. Because you're in control of your mind, will, and emotions. And your conscience should now be clear through the grace of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about the practical part of the conscience and how it all plays into this. Because all he's trying to do is try to get your conscience off. We'll get into all that. And the practical thing, thank you, Austin, and the authority of the believer is exactly right. Now, your spirit is sealed. That's why you can feel safe and secure because now you have the authority. Authority has been given back to us from Jesus through this resurrected body. When he resurrected, he said, now, hey, I give you the power to lose the mind, the keys to heaven. So Satan can do absolutely, here's the encouragement, the, and thank you, it's a prophetic word, and with encouragement is this. We as believers have been given all the authority back. Satan can do nothing to us because of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, unless he has to look for, it says the devil, prowls around looking for an opportunity. So if we choose to abuse grace and we choose to sin, sin has its own consequences. That's why it can open a door, an opportunity to Satan to wreak havoc. But then we just have to say, okay, well, I don't want to sin anymore because I don't want to give any opportunity to Satan. I just want to continue to try to focus on Jesus. And just by focusing on Jesus is the way out for everything. His love and his grace and his mercy. So, thank you, Austin. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk more about that, even more practical. If this is your first time hearing this, just keep coming back. I'm going to make it more and more simple in the weeks to come. Let me just pray one sec because my spirit's stirred. You don't understand that this is flesh for God. We'll go to the psalm and then we'll come back for the final encouragement. Andy, will you read Revelation 4 or 5? This is the wrong room. Okay. Yeah. So there is a verse, I think it's in Hebrews. No, it's in there. Paul said that one, so I can do that too. She's asked me to go to the Revelation. It says, come to the throne of God boldly now. So that's what in the spirit is. We can enter into Revelation chapter four. This is where you can begin to commune and fellowship in the spirit of the throne room because it's it says that the, the curtain's been pulled back. It was destroyed. And so that's why when you even read Revelation, he says, I was in the spirit. It says, come up to the throne now. Well, Paul was still in a body, but in, he went in the spirit. He went and connected. So this is part of learning to live in the spirit, where you can have communion and fellowship in the house of God in prayer. And here's Revelation chapter 4. How do we go there? It's written. The Bible talks a lot about your imagination. He gives us the images so that we enter into it. So here's the image of the throne. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open, open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me was like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit. You see how he had to go to the open door? He had to go into it to enter into the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald circle. So that's a green circle around the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Seated on them were 24 elders. 
They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear and crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third was faced like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come.
the verses. So Jesus spoke this. He said, it is written. He said, my house will be called a house of prayer. I think this has multiple fulfillments. He said the temple was his body. And we know that he wants us to be in prayer continuously, right? We read that verse. So that starts with us first individually. He wants us to be a house of prayer. Always contemplating on the absolute truth within us. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the power of the Holy Spirit, all the absolute truth, so that we're victorious in this life. We become that house. But he also wants this house to become a house of prayer, a place of where we govern out of his spirit, out of his word, out of the absolute truth of, of Christ. The opposite is, but you're making a den of robbers. So Satan's the one who steals, kills, and destroys. He's trying to get us away from prayer communion fellowship with God. He's trying to get us so busy. He's trying to get our mind on so many things out here so that he can control it so that we stop with the communion and fellowship with God because that will produce a parenting effect. If God is life, the more you're in him, the more what you have? Life. So the more you're in the world and you're away from life, what are you going to get more of? World, but you're going to feel less life. That's the deception. We're going to talk more about the practical realities of those things. you just got to learn how to take back control of what Satan's been stealing from us. It's a very practical thing. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's why it goes on, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. The Greek is for that word is disorderly, unruly. So all that's happening, why the church has gotten idle, is the rules of this world are trumping the rules of heaven. There are, there are spiritual laws and there are natural laws. All Jesus was saying is the spiritual laws actually have more power for you if you understand them. But all Satan's trying to do is, is to get it unruly into the rules of the natural realm and get you focused on this because it's all relative and it'll perish. It's not eternal. And so that's why the church has gotten idle. Just oh, idle. It's idolizing. It's not moving. It's static because it's 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 not it's gotten unruly and out of the order that Jesus said. Now it says to encourage the disheartened. So if you're disheartened, be encouraged. Be encouraged that there is a way out for every single person. Someone even used to hear this. First, I'm going to ask this: Do you believe that Jesus is God? I want you to think about. It. Do you believe that God is the creator of the earth and the entire universe and however you want to explain on whatever layers or levels in all galaxies and all however language you want to find? Do you believe that he is the uncreated being? Do you think he's afraid of sickness and death? Because he's eternal. He can, that's why the, the men of faith, the faith and women of faith, the faith chapter, they were not afraid of death because they're like, he's creator. He can recreate it. That's what he is. That's what he's doing. That's the point. They weren't afraid of it because he was God. And so they weren't afraid of these things. They weren't afraid of sickness. They weren't afraid of that. Jesus wasn't either. You think God's afraid of a germ? Seriously, let's just be real. A germ is something that you cannot see, right? You have to get in a microscope to see that thing. So you're placing faith that that microscope is telling you the truth. It's no different than the opposite is... I can't see the macro of God right now, so I'm placing faith through the macroscope of the Bible that this is real. You're just deciding in your soul what's more real to you, the macro or the micro. And if the micro has greater power, it wins out. If the macro has greater power, it wins out. And that's the authority that he gave us. That's why I'm trying to encourage you, anybody that's disheartened, help the weak. Be patient with how many? Be patient with everyone. Is that people in the church? Yeah. Is that new Christians? Is that the legalistic Pharisee or Sadducee? Is that the pagan? Yes, because love is the first thing out of his mouth. Patient. Love is the most powerful force there is. We're supposed to be patient with everyone in this. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Man, I just gotta say that somebody this is for somebody. I don't know why. There's this eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's wrong for wrong. Why we're why when people come to me most often in counseling, 
is what they're trying to do is they want me to share there's always two sides of stories and we're all imperfect, right? So everybody's made mistakes in every relationship. But people come to me and they want me to hear their side and to say you're right and justify their position so that then they can go and smack that person because they're wrong. We've got to become more mature and understand and outwit the devil. If you do that, that's why it says pay back no one wrong for wrong. If you lay down law, you're defiling yourself because now you're placing yourself as the judge and you're getting out of grace. And if you're under the law, you're under a what? Curse, if you know the word of God. You've just gotten out of God's pure grace and now entered into a curse, even though you don't have to be, and you're destroying yourself. I know that may not make sense to all of you right now, but it will if you keep listening and coming back. I'll share the verses with you, but somebody needed to hear that. Don't pay back wrong for wrong. That's why Jesus didn't. He says, let revenge be mine. When he comes back, he is going to repay everything. He's just saying this, don't let the devil outwit you, remain where you're at, remain meek, have greater understanding, and that's how you become victorious, because now you keep your heart postured in the right position, so you don't enter into a perishing effect of anxiety, frustration, because here's what will destroy you, anxiety, bitterness, frustration, those things are the, that's not godly spirit. Things that will give you life, is faith, the opposite of fear. The opposite of frustration is peace. The opposite of bitterness is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. See how it works? It's just principles. Don't be deceived by Satan. Always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Everybody ask, what's God's will for you? There you go. In Christ Jesus, do not quench the spirit. So if it says do not quench it, that means we can quench it. If you want to choose to not forgive, you will quench the spirit. Pride, self-centeredness, quenches the spirit of God. He's always wanting to flow, but you're choosing to enter into the wrong spirit, therefore it quenches the right spirit. That is, we have the power of free will and choice in love. So just trying to help you with the practical realities. That's why it says, hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. I'm trying to teach you how to reject every kind of evil. There's a deception to this. May God himself be God of peace. So if you're not in peace, are you really in Christ? Sanctify mm -hmm. you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's where we're going to go and teach and come at the practical realities of this, this new way, this new philosophy that Jesus taught, be kept blameless at the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. See how everything is centered on his return again? He's just saying, here's how you overcome this age. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, renewing your mind, everything you're given, overcome now until Jesus returns. He'll take revenge. He'll right every wrong. Let him do it. The one who calls on you is faithful. He will do it. So I hope, do you have anything? I'm getting you might have something to say. I just thought a simple thing when that turn so they can hear you. No. She doesn't like the name of I'm trying to encourage to get the key thing in her. No, it was just very simple. Make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong. And I just got a very simple word of don't take matters into your own hands. Put them in mind. Amen. 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 Well, I got one last thing. Andy. I know it's way late. But Andy. Here's, here's the issue. I know it's way late. I got to say this. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Contempt means despise, make no account. People are treating the book of Revelation and Jesus' second coming with contempt. It means you're not taking it seriously. Church, we need to start taking these things seriously in this new way to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit because the days are going to get darker. We're in what's called a hiatus of the next birth pain. There is more coming. It says there are going to be more birth pains. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars, plagues, and pestilence. A plague is something that doctors can't control. We just had that in COVID. There's going to be more coming. You've got to start to grow 
and it, try to excel in these things. So as these things come, you're victorious. And if you take the future prophecies with contempt, you reap what you sow. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to exhort you to get you to eagerly see this. So let me end and say, God is good. Holy Spirit is good. Amen.